Hallelujah to Jesus. It's good to be here. And I want to thank God for your lives. Thank you for having me. We thank God for what God has been doing since yesterday that we started this conference. We really appreciate Him for what He did in the morning and the afternoon session. And I want to really appreciate you once again for giving our time for God, to learn of God, to know of God. And I know that tonight again, God will be taking us further from where we stopped yesterday night. Let us pray. My Father and my God, I really appreciate you for tonight again. Thank you for your children who you have been ministering to since yesterday, since this conference started. Thank you for the utterance. Thank you, Lord, for the revelation. Thank you for the deep things that you have begun to show to us and to impact into our lives, ministries, and destinies. I said to our thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Tonight again we are here to learn in your presence. Holy Spirit, please teach us. Open our lives, our hearts, our destinies to your word. Thank you, Lord, for all you are going to do. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. So tonight again, we want to look further from where we stopped yesterday night. Yesterday night, I started talking about teach us. Of course, the general theme of this program is teach us to pray. So yesterday night, I started with teach us because I'm going to be ministering for three days. So the first aspect is teach us. Today, I'm going to be talking about when you pray, when you pray. And I trust God again that tonight is going to give us deep revelations. But tonight I like to take my text from another uh, instance, another account of the teaching of Jesus on prayers. Yesterday night we looked at Luke chapter 11 verse 1. But tonight I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 6 verses 5 to 8. And that is our focus for tonight. It was the same account of how the disciples came to Jesus, demanding or requiring that Jesus would teach them how to pray. But this account is a little bit different, not really different in, in, in content, content and context, but it is fuller, so to speak. So I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 to 8. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Verse 6. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Verse 7. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. The heathen there means the Gentiles, the unbelievers, the religious people who possibly have some form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. So as the Eden do, for they think that they shall be heard of their much speaking. Be not therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask. So tonight, I'm going to be talking about three types of prayers as we saw in this our text. Three different types that like Jesus was trying to teach the disciples. And you know, in life, there are times that if for you to uh, identify and appreciate the original or the right thing in life, you have to know what the wrong things are. If you don't know the original of something, it will be easy for you to get a fake of it. You know, something happened about a few days ago. I want to buy polish, shoe polish. 
And so when I got there, the normal way, I just saw the police, the Polish outside, and I said I wanted to buy. And the woman told me the price, and I tried to bargain, and she said, okay. But I don't know whether it was the Holy Spirit or something. I was just like, okay, I don't want this one that I've been in the sun. In fact, I said I insisted that she should open it. So she opened it, and we discovered that the surface is smeared. So I said, I don't want that. Then I said, I wanted another one that was kept inside. The woman now spoke up and said, the one that she will bring from inside, the price is different. I was like, why? She now said, that is the original. She now began to show me the difference. I, show, I saw a label on the original that is different from the one that I saw. And it's, she told me that that one inside, that even if you put it under the sun, it will not be like this. So now I will have bought the fake one because I didn't even know the original. So there are times you need to know the original and also you need to know the fake so that you can identify the original. So Jesus, using this principle, was trying to teach the disciples that, okay, there are three types of prayers. Some of them, there are two of them that you have to avoid. And there is a particular one that I expect you to know. And so I'm going to be talking about those. Those three types as we saw in our text. Again, like I said yesterday night, I am a fast talker. Please just bear with me. I will just be dropping the notes and just take your time to go over them. And, um, you know, we'll be on the same page at the end of the day. I will try as much as possible, like I said yesterday night, to manage my time in such a way that I will not bore you unnecessarily. So, when you pray, I'm talking about when you pray. A lot of times, the reason why some things we call or we label prayer do not produce results or do not give us maximum result as we expect is because we lack the basic understanding of the principles of how effective prayer should work according to the teaching of Jesus in that Matthew chapter 6 verse 5 to 8. There are times that we pray, we think we labor in prayers, but because the principles that Jesus was trying to emphasize, we don't follow it, we don't realize it, we don't follow it, and as such, we don't get the benefit, the full benefit that prayer ordinarily should, uh, 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 should make available to us. So we therefore need to take note of certain things that Jesus was trying to emphasize to the disciples while he was trying to teach them how to pray. And so tonight, like I said, I'm going to be talking about three of them. The first one is the prayer of the hypocrites. The prayer of the hypocrite. I go back to the text again. I read verse 5. When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray. Can you imagine that? The first surprising thing about this set of people, known as the hypocrites, is that they love to pray. Can you imagine that? They love to pray, but then, the fact that a man loves to pray does not necessarily mean that the person has a good understanding or has a correct mentality and mindset about prayers. Jesus said they love to pray. And the fact that you love to pray on the mountain, in your room, on your knees, or whatever position you take, does not necessarily guarantee that you are going to get the maximum result of the prayers. Because Jesus, Jesus was teaching here, he said, the hypocrites, they love to pray. And have you seen people who love to pray, but you don't see the result of the prayers in their lives? We will see shortly why, why it is so, according to the very teachings of Jesus. So the first thing about the hypocrites is that they love to pray. So loving to pray is not a guarantee to answer prayers or to maximizing the potentiality of prayers. The next thing in that verse 5 is, the Bible says, they love to pray standing in the, in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets. Can you imagine that? And at times, your prayer is not necessarily about where you stood. 
Mm -mm. And that's why, you know, a lot of teachings are going up and down about going to the mountain. I'm not saying it is bad to go to the mountain. Anywhere you go to that you have the least distraction is your mountain. If your room is the place where you can have the least of... So it is not necessarily answer to prayers or getting results from prayers is not where you stand. But to these people, they would like to stand where people will see them. So their motive for praying is to be seen of men. And there are people like that in the church. And possibly you are even here listening to me and you are like that. Jesus called that kind of a prayer the prayer of the hypocrites. When people are praying and they are, they, 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 they are making a lot of noise in their rooms and people, even their neighbors could not sleep. Can you imagine? Jesus said it is not that kind of a prayer that actually, I mean, determines whether you will get results. Some people, in their heart of heart, if you ask them what they are praying, they are praying to impress others. Bro, someone will know that I can pray, and they begin to shout until they lose their voice. That, losing your voice or shouting on top of your voices does not necessarily guarantee that your prayers are going to be answered. If your mentality, your motive for praying is to be seen or heard of men, Jesus said they like to stand in the, on, the, on the streets where people will see them. Some people will not even sit or stand where people will see them, but where people will hear them as they, as they are making noise like grinding, grinding machine. That is not what prayer is. That does not necessarily mean that we are prayerful. It could only mean the prayer of the Pharisee, I mean of the hypocrites. Let's continue. Okay, now moving on now. I said the motive for praying is so important. So, your motive for prayers will determine the result of your prayers. If your motive is that if I get to church today, they will know. If I begin to pray on the mountain, everybody will shut up because they will know that my style and gymnastic of prayer will shut their mouth. Then it will determine whether you will have, have results for your prayers or not. And surprisingly, or funnily enough, even such prayers have their own reward. Let's complete that verse 5. Jesus said, Because they like to, to stand in the synagogues, in the corners of the street. Uh, you know, let me quickly talk about synagogues now. Synagogues, of course, means church, the temple. When the Bible is talking about synagogue in the days of Jesus, or the temple is talking about our own version of church today. You, you, I don't know whether you have seen some people who like to pray long prayers in the church. They can pray for 10 minutes, non-stop, and they will be going to every corner and dimensions and branching here and there. But go and see some of such people when they are praying at home. They cannot pray like that. Those are the, 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 the hypocrites. They love to pray and want, want to impress people. And if you are such like that, it is not too late for you to change. Your, your God sees beyond all these words that we are saying. He sees into our heart. So prayer is more of a thing of the heart than the thing of the mouth. I don't know whether you are getting that. Okay, so Jesus now said they like to, to, to stand in, in, in synagogues and on the corners of the streets and that they may be seen of men. Or I also add that they may be heard of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Even such prayers have their reward. That is, such prayers of the hypocrites, God does not need to answer it. The motive from the onset is for people to hear them. And so when people are hearing them and are commenting them, ah, but Samuel, oh, he prays a lot. If you hear him praying, he can pray for two hours. All the reward for that prayer, he has, he, they have gotten it. The people they want to see them have seen them. The people they want to hear them have heard them. As they are praying in the church and they are expecting people to clap for them and say, ah, this man can pray for long. That is their reward. So are you, now be, are you now beginning to see why some people are not getting results? Because the motive of their heart is wrong. They want people to acknowledge that they can pray in the public. They want people to know that they are prayer warrior. And all that they will get from that prayer war, 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 I mean warfare is the reward of getting people to know. And the people have applauded them. So if Jesus is saying 
I'm teaching you to pray. He's saying, don't pray like those hypocrites. Let your mentality and your motive for prayers be pure, be right, be correct. Because if you are praying to men, you will get the result of, of from men. And what can men do to you? Clap for you, commend you, and greet you that, oh, El Kushe. That is number one. Let's move on quickly. I want to jump to verses 7 and 8 now to see another uh, type of prayer that we should not encourage ourselves to pray according to the very teaching of Jesus. I go to chapter uh, verse 7 and 8. Okay. He said, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the Eden do. So the the the, the subtopic of this uh, second type of prayer is the prayer of the hidden. The hidden means the Gentiles. It means the unbelievers. In fact, in the Bible, according to Bible uh, reference, in this context, it means uh, the the idolaters, idol worshippers, people who believe in other gods apart from the living God. So the hidden in this. Because, you know, uh, sometimes when you see the Eden in the Bible, uh, it talks about other nations that are not the nation of Israel. And at times it talks about the people that believe in other things apart from God, that have smaller gods. So in this context, the Eden here is talking about people who have other gods. Some of them are familiar spirits. Some of them, they have some other religions. So they, they also have their own type of prayers. For the Bible says, Jesus said, as the eating do, for they think that they shall be heard of their, of their much speaking. Now, the first thing I want to say about the prayer of the eating, as taught by Jesus, is that they make use of vain repetitions. Vain repetitions. But I must quick to say here that repeating the prayer point is not vain repetition. For instance, I want to go and sit for an exam next week. So first day of the week, maybe Saturday next week. On Monday, I pray, God, let me pass this exam. On Tuesday, I, pa- I pray, God, let me pass this exam. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. That is not very repetition. Because the Bible even says, pray until your joy is full. And if you read the account of Jesus, when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed a number of times you know he was coming to meet the disciples and asking them why are you sleeping pray for me and when he goes back he was praying the same prayers so that is not very repetition so you have to understand so if your prayer has not produced result as we want over a particular thing you keep praying it until you have result that does not mean very repetition but you know very repetition in the context in which jesus is speaking here is a ritualistic enchanting or chanting so to speak that is common with pagans and some religious sects who believe that it is insane one word repeatedly that they will get result i don't want to mention any particular religious uh, sect but you know some sects who begin to say the same thing like do it do it do it do it the way they are saying it they are not saying it for emphasis, they are saying it because they believe that it is in saying it repeatedly, chanting it, that it will produce result. And so, as believers, you know, Jesus had to tell the believer, I mean, the disciples there, because they were living among such people as at that time. And of course, even here and right now in our generation, we have even church people who are doing something similar. Who believe that you have to chant it, chant it, chant it, so that you know those prayers are not meant to to. I mean, they are not they are not meant for God. So it's not a ritualistic repetition that will actually guarantee performance. I hope you get the fact that it is not repeating prayer, but vain repetition. Do it, 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 until you know it. Be, they, some of them now go to a particular realm that it will not be. A, it will be as if they have even they have uh, uh, transferred their spirit to another thing. So that is what Jesus is actually talking about. So, 
it could also mean trying to embellish your, your request. That is very repetition. That you are saying you are embellishing it and you are saying all manner of things as if you want to you want to bamboozle God or you want to use your words to to convince God to to cajole him. That is not the type of prayer that a believer should pray. So you must understand that when Jesus is saying the hidden pray, you don't pray the, the pattern they pray. I don't know whether I'm getting blessed. So it is not the amount of many words you can put together to embellish your world, to make it look attractive to God, that will get the attention of God. God cannot be bribed by such things. So you have to understand. So when we talk about teach us to pray, we must understand the principles of prayers as taught by Jesus himself. Now, moving on again, talking about the prayer of the Eden. I think I've done justice to that. Well, let me go to verse 8. He said, be not yet therefore like unto them. Like, like that, that is, don't behave like the hidden. For your father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask. Mm. Your father knoweth what you, what you need before you ask. It's not the father that it is until you ask that he knows you need it. He created you in the first place. So he knows whatever you need even before you ask. And somebody would want to ask. Then if he knows what I need, why would he want me to ask? That is the principle. I'm going to be talking about that tomorrow. But let me quickly say this. I don't know whether you remember what happened with Adam and Eve. Adam, let me say, when, when God discovered that he was lonely, was playing with the animals and you know uh, there was nobody like like him and God said okay it was not it is not good that this man should be alone let us look for some somebody that can accompany him that can uh, 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 fellowship with him that can be his partner uh, remember that he did not ask God and so God just gave it to him and so when problem came after the wife had eaten the forbidden fruit and he has also eaten it with him with her and God came and was trying to say, why did you do this? He said, the wife you gave me. You know the meaning of that statement? I didn't even ask you for a wife. So you were the one that gave me wife. Not that wife. So it was as, it's as if he was blaming God. And so I think since that time, God has made up his mind that, okay, whatever anybody we want to need, even though I know their need, let them ask. And so it's a principle in God's kingdom that Whatever you need, even though God knows, ask. That is why Jesus will say in Matthew 7, 7, ask, you shall be given, seek, you shall find, knock, and it shall be opened. Even though I know what you need, you have to ask. And so, it's a principle that we must follow. So God knows, I'm going to come up to tidy up this quickly, but let me go to the main thing for the day. Let me go for the main thing to the main thing for the day. Now, the prayer of the righteous. The prayer of the righteous. So, to the main business of the day, the prayer of the righteous. Because, of course, like I said initially, that we have to know the, the fake so that we can um, appreciate the original. So, now, let's go to verse 6 back. Then I'll go back and try to round off or tidy up uh, verse 8. And that is where we're going to call it a day or a night verse 6 let me read it matthew chapter 5 verse uh, chapter 6 verse 6 but thou when thou prayest that is you when you pray enter into thy closet and when thou hast shut thy door pray to thy father take note of thy closet thy door thy father which is in secret and thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. So I'm going to be talking about four major things that Jesus was trying to teach intentionally from that scripture. I'm talking again, the prayer of the righteous. I've given you an insight into 
the two types of prayers that Jesus did not want us to pray or does not want us to pray. The prayer of the hypocrites, the prayer of the idiom. But now, how does he want us to pray? The first thing is your closet. He said, when thou pray, now take note again, he didn't say if you pray. If we make prayer to be, maybe if you like, conditionally. Mm -mm. He says when, meaning that Prayer is not optional. If you are going to be a good Christian, it's not optional. So when you pray, when you decide to pray, he said, the first thing is that enter, when you pray, enter into your closet. I'm talking about your closet. Your closet there actually is not necessarily a geographical location or Neither is he talking about secrecy per se, but it is a spiritual location. Now, when the, Jesus is saying your closet, he's saying he's personifying it. As a Christian, do you have a place where you regularly or in a spiritual sense that God can say this is where this brother, this sister, comes to pray. Do you have, just like you have a phone, you have a SIM card that can be identified with you, that can be traced to you. Do you have a closet in the heavenly realm that God sees you regularly? So when Jesus is saying, go to your closet, it is not necessarily talking about a geographical location where you go to your room and shut the door. Because in actual sense, there are different types of prayers that time may not permit me to talk about. Different places. We have congregational prayer, we have fellowship, I mean, uh, family prayer, and all of that. Those are all types of prayers. But this closet I'm talking about tonight is your own place. As Elijah would say confidently to people, he would say, God, in the presence of whom I stand. You know, even know that, what that means? I have a place before God. That once I get there, God knows that Elijah has come. God knows that our last one come, he has come. So he has a closet. He has a place, just like a post office. If you have a number in post office in those days, you are the one that has the key to that post office. So if you go there, you open it and bring out the letters in it. Do you have a closet with God? So if our prayers will be effective, we must have your own closet. Not necessarily a place. It's a geography. I mean, it's a spiritual location where you always stand, where heaven, God always meets you, where you are, you 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 are located is 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 given to you, where the angels come to take your prayers. I no, I I I don't want to dwell so much on that. But I have a lot of revelation for that because I'm watching time. So Jesus said, "Go to your closet." And so tonight, the challenge there is, if you don't have a closet as yet, this is the time to go. Let God know your closet. Create an altar for yourself that God can constantly see you there. Elijah will say, God, in the presence of whom I stand. So if I say anything, I'm not saying it flippantly. I'm saying it because I, am, I have a stand in God's presence. So do you have a stand in God's presence? Let me go on quickly because of time. Another thing that Jesus said is, is he now said, after you have entered your closet, shut your door. Mm. Like I said, that is not necessarily talking about secrecy. That, okay, I close my door, so all of you go out, I want to pray. No, even though that could also mean that you are trying to avoid some distractions physically, but the revelation I got from there is that this does not necessarily mean the physical door. Door that you are shutting, we mean that you are avoiding distraction. Not shutting the physical door. It is as if everything that can distract your heart, it could be your phone. It could be your mind. You know, there are times that you are trying to pray. I don't know whether it has happened to you. If it has not happened to you before, then maybe you are faking it or uh, or maybe you are not a real person. You are trying to pray, but your mind is thinking of, of something else. It has happened to me severally. 
I remember the first time I, I bought my first car some years back. For days, I couldn't pray because each time I pray, I see myself driving. So when Jesus is saying, shut your door, he's saying, shut your mind, shut your phone, shut your physical door, shut your mind, shut everything that can be a distraction to you. So it means full concentration. When Jesus says, shut your door, he's not saying the door of your house, your own, your own, your own door. Because there are things in our mind, your, your mind can be noisy in the place of prayers. So when Jesus is saying, shut your door, he's saying, remove all distractions that will not allow you to connect with God. Shut your door, not the physical door. I don't know whether I'm making any sense. Another thing that Jesus said there, in that verse 6, the same, he said, and your father, mm, that is deep. You pray to your father. And I ask you this question. Who are you really praying to? Like the first question, I mean, the, the first thing I was talking about when we were talking about the hypocrites. Some people pray so that others can hear them. So if you go to the place of prayer, Jesus is saying, pray to your father. You know, Jesus was deliberate about using those words. Jesus is not, he, he's not a man that just speaks anyhow he speaks his words he didn't say pray to my father even though jesus knew that god is his father but he was praying pray to your your own your father so who are you really praying to your father or their father or our father this is talking about personal relationship with god your father not our father not their father because some people, some youths particularly, they see God as the God of their parents, not their God. Jesus was deliberate to say, your father. And of course, if God is not your father, then whatever thing you say, you think you are doing in the place of prayer is a waste of time. Because prayer is meant to be made to your father, your, your father. This talks about relationship. There must be a pre-existing relationship between you and the God you claim you are praying to. He must be able to say, you are my son, and you must be able to say, you are my father. Not necessarily on the lips, on your lips alone, but in evidential proofs that you belong to him, you know him, and he knows you, your father. And prayer to you as a believer should not be a visitation by a stranger. No, that, okay, I need something. Let me quickly go. And, you know, I imagine somebody coming to my house every now and then and say, Daddy, uh, sir, give me, give me 10 era. He goes again, 10 months later, he comes, give me. No, I, I, I will call him and tell him, don't come here again. I, I don't know you. So it must be a prayer to your father. You are not a stranger to God each time you come. God already knows your voice. She knows that this sister has come again. I know her voice. Jesus said something in John chapter 10. He said, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. They will hear my voice and they will follow me. He does, if you can flip that statement. So if I hear their voice too, I will respond to them. So prayer is not a, an occasional thing or a stranger, a stranger to stranger kind of a thing. It must be to your father. And that is why a lot of people don't get results. If there's something that Christianity as a religion, not as a relationship, I'm sorry to say that, has abused his prayers. Everybody is praying now, including 419, including thieves, including prostitutes. Praying to who? A father, I don't think God answers such people. Jesus was telling a woman, he said, how will I give the, the, the meat that belongs to son to dogs? To dogs. Meaning even God recognizes that before I can do anything for any other person, my own children who recognizes me or who recognize me as their father will go first get my attention. He said the crumbs that get from under the table is the one that gets to the others. So if you want to get the full benefit of prayers, God must be your father and you must maintain a cordial, consistent, persistent relationship with him. 
And so, another thing that Jesus said in that verse 6, and he said, Pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret mm, shall reward thee openly. And another thing I want to say there is that your father sees secrets. So it means that you can you cannot fake it before God. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 3, there about that by God actions are weighed. So if you are thinking you are faking it, you are an hypocrite, and you are saying, Ah, I am praying to God, God, you must answer. God sees your secret. And so a lot of times, all these little, little things that looks as if they are not important, that is what God is looking at. That is why our prayer life are not productive, are not fruitful. Our Father sees beyond whatever we are saying with our mouth. People will be commending you and say you are praying, you are a prayer word, but God sees the secrets. So your Father knows your secrets, and His reward and answer is dependent on what He sees in your secrets. I don't know whether you got that statement. You cannot, you cannot deceive God. You cannot deceive God. You can close all the doors on the earth and you will still not be in the secret. You can close the door, the, the gates to your house, the door to the sitting room, the door to your room, and even go to your wardrobe and pray. God sees beyond all of that. So a secret place is not necessarily a place that is secret as far as geographical location is concerned. A secret place is the place in which God, you are open to God and God is open to you. God sees your heart. So closing all the doors, shutting all the doors does not necessarily guarantee secrecy because God sees all of those things. So your father knows your secret and his reward an answer to your prayer is dependent on what he sees in the secret. If your secret is that you, are, you have a lot of sins, bitterness, anger, malice in your secret, God sees it. In other words, open reward is a result of secret labor. Mm. Please digest some of these words. Open reward. Because the Bible says that your father who sees your secret, he knows that you are, pay, play, you are either praying right or not. He knows it. So, he will openly reward you if he sees that your secret place is correct. So, if you want results for your prayers, your secrets must be right, must be correct. So, your father will openly reward. So, now, the physical manifestation or the effectiveness of prayers is seen in the open, but actually the labor is in the secret. You must understand that. I'm trying to rush now because my time is up. When testimonies of answered prayers are lacking in your life, it is a testimony to the fact that something is wrong in your secret place. Because prayer is, is, is a, an activity that is done in the secret. And let me say this, somebody will be asking that uh, in the secret, what about the prayers I pray in the church? You know, it is a mentality that... If I am going to pray and God will answer and God will take note of my prayer, I must have this mindset that each time I am praying, I am not praying and I'm still, uh, 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 I'm still uh, uh, familiar with my environment. Even when I'm in the congregation and they, they, they are asking us to pray, I am praying with that mentality that I am still in the secret. I am not aware of my environment. That's why you see some people this, I mean, displaying a lot of ignorance in prayers. As they are praying, they are pulling their skirts, they are cleaning their shoe. That is, now, that is not a kind of prayer that produces results. You must have that mentality of going to the secret place of God, where God can recognize you, where you can connect to God. I don't know whether you are getting blessed. So, when you want to have an open reward, an open testimony of an effective, effectual prayer, you must labor right in the secret. 
I round off now by going to the last thing I said I was going to round off, I mean, uh, wrap up because my time is up. So, verse 8 says, be, ye, be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things ye have, ye have need of before you ask. So, if you got or if you get all of these things that I've said right by the grace of God, you can be rest assured. That as you pray, you are not praying for something that God does not have. You are praying for something that God has already prepared for you and that he knows that you need them even before you were created. Look at God, for instance, when he was creating heaven and earth. He has, he has created everything man would ever need before creating man. And so the same principle is what God operates. The same way some parents will even open accounts for their children. Do you think God is not a wiser, one million times that, that, that man? So he knows what you need. And so when you pray, that should excite you that if you do it right, God knows what you need even before you pray. He just wants you to ask and he will give to you. The prodigal son, all he asked, the father gave him. And the father still has more, much more. And that is God to you. So at times, because God knows what we need. So when we pray the right way, he, he wants us to pray. He, he, we even add other things that we didn't ask or that we didn't even know that we need. Do you remember Solomon? What Solomon thought he needed was wisdom. But because he understood the mind of God and he prayed right, God added words to him. So the same way which we have that understanding that after we have gotten it right, we are not praying like the hypocrite, we are not praying like the Eden, we are praying righteously in following the principles that Jesus taught us. Jesus, God has the capacity to give us more because he knows what we need, more than we that need it. Hallelujah to Jesus. So as I round off tonight, don't forget, if our prayer lives will be effective, we must follow the teachings of Jesus as we have seen tonight. So tomorrow again, by the grace of God, I will continue and we will see some other aspects. Thank you for listening listening to the message. I want you to get back to me if you are, if you have gotten, I mean, you are, you, are, you are blessed. Thank you so much for listening. So tomorrow again, we are going to go a little bit further when you pray. That is the topic tonight. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for another revelation time in your presence. Thank you for all that you did, how you have opened our eyes and our hearts to your word. Be thou exalted in Jesus' name. We ask in your name, O oh Lord, that this revelation that you have given to us, they will not just be mere revelations that we add to our head knowledge, but they will add to our effective prayers. They will inspire us. They will, they, they will provoke us to do so much more in the place of prayers and get results that will make our lives glorious and to fulfill and conform with what we have in mind for our lives and destinies. Thank you so, so much for what you have done tonight. As this conference continues tomorrow, Lord, take us to perfection. Glorify yourself. Thank you, Lord, for all you have done. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. So God bless you, brethren, for listening. I appreciate you. See you tomorrow night. Good night.